Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures. This is Math 095, section 6.2. We're going to graph linear equations. Now, if we recall in 6.1, we discussed the Cartesian coordinate uh, system, or our graph. And we worked with this line right here, x plus 2y equals 9. And if we recall, this had more than one solution. And we built a t-table. And we found some ordered pairs. If x is negative 2, y is 11 halves, and so on. Now, in fact, this equation actually has infinite solutions. So how do we represent infinite solutions? That's where we can apply a Cartesian coordinate graph. So <clears throat> since we have a t table and we know that these are ordered pairs for a value of x, we get a value of y when x is one value, y is some other value. And since we have these ordered pairs, let's go ahead and put a few of them on the graph. Um, <clears throat> let's look at the first one here. We have negative 2 and 11 halves. Well, 11 halves is the same as 5 and 1 half. So when x is negative 2, and we know this is our y, and this is our x, and they cross at 0, 0 origin. They're like two number lines. So if I'm going to graph the ordered uh, pair, negative 2 and 11 halves, x is negative 2, so I move 2 to the left. And 11 halves, well, that's a positive value. So I'm going to move up 5 and 1 half. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 1 half. So this is the ordered pair. And I'll write it right here, negative 2, 11 halves. So I'm labeling my point. So if you're ever asked to label a point, make sure you write it as an ordered pair, x, y. If we graph the next point, negative 1, 5, well, when x is negative 1, I move 1 to the left, and I go up 5 in the y. This would be the point negative 1, 5. So <clears throat> I'm not going to label that ordered pair. Otherwise, my graphs are going to get a little bit crowded. If we look at the next ordered pair, 0, 9 halves, when x is 0, y is 9 halves, or 4 and a half. So when x is 0, we're right on the y-axis. And then I'm going to go up 4 and a half. And our next point when x is 1 half, because it's not always going to be a nice integer. Sometimes it'll be a fraction. So we have 1 half. y is 17 quarters, or 4 and 1 quarter, if we were to write that as a mixed number. So when x is 1 half, so I'm in between the first mark here and the y-axis. That would be 1 half in the x direction, positive 1 half. And then we're going to go up. 4 and 1 quarter. 1, 2, 3, 4 and a quarter puts me right about there. All right, the next point, we have 1, 4. So if I'm going to graph that, I'm 1 in the x direction and 4 in the y. And the last point we have here is 3, 3. So when x is 3, I move 3 to the right. And then I go up 3 to the y. And I'll label this point 3, 3. Now, what we notice here is all of these points seem to be in a nice straight line. So this, if I continued to uh, put in points, and I could put in an infinite number of points in between here, we can see that they're all going to line up. Not the straightest of lines, but hopefully you understand the concept. So what we have here is we're a representation of the infinite solutions that represent this equation, x plus 2y equals 9. And uh, we're going to define some of these special values shortly where they actually intersect. And we already know this point because we graphed it. So I'll label that one. When x was 0, we were on the y-axis. We got 9 halves. And we'll talk about that uh, point later. So <clears throat> we can see that we have infinite solutions. Now, when it comes to representing equations of lines, which we call linear equations, to represent their infinite solutions, sometimes we have to define what a linear equation is. So the next thing we're going to look at is a linear equation in standard form. Here we have ax plus by equals c. This is a linear equation in standard form where a, b, and c are just integers. They're constants. Um, or, well, they might be fractions. But they're any real number, a, b, and c. And we notice x and y, if we look at x and y, what is their powers? What is their degree? Well, because there's nothing written, we assume 1. So these are first degree variables, right? We have two variables, and they're both to the first degree. This is how we identify a linear equation. So let's look at a few of these and identify if they're linear equations. 
Well, I have the variable x and y, so I have two variables. But I notice the power here is 2. This is not a linear equation. This is a second degree equation. So <clears throat> if it's not linear, let's move on. If we look at this one, we have an x and a y, two variables. And I notice their powers are each 1. And because that, of the two variables, their powers are both 1, this is a linear equation. y equals 1 half x plus 4. But if we want to put it in standard form, essentially what we can do is move uh, or use our rules of algebra to move things around here, to put it into a standard form. Well, one of the tools we learned in a previous section in Chapter 5 is to eliminate fractions. Because this is an equation, an equal sign, I can eliminate those fractions. So I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by 2 to just get rid of this fraction of 1 half. My denominator is 2. So I get 2y equals 2 times 1 half, because we're using the distributive property. I'm going to get 1x, or just x. 2 times 4 gives me 8. And now I can get my variables on one side and the constant on the other. So it's of the form ax plus by equals c. I'm going to subtract x from both sides. And because these aren't like terms, I can't combine them. Negative x plus 2y equals 8. And we can now see it is in standard form, where my a value is a negative 1, the coefficient of x. My b value is a 2. And my constant is an 8. So this is a linear equation in standard form, ax plus by equals c. If we look at this equation, is it a linear equation? Actually, it is, but it cannot be written in standard form because there's only one variable, x equals negative 8. This is a constant. And we're going to define this special linear equation uh, shortly in this video. So <clears throat> it cannot be written in standard form. It is what it is. x is negative 8. We leave it just like that. This is actually the standard form for uh, a line that we define as being a vertical line. All right, let's look at some other examples, and we're going to graph them. I have y equals 2x, y equals negative 2x, y equals negative 1 half x, and y equals 2x minus 1. If we want to represent the infinite solutions that each of these have, they're all a little different, we can plot the ordered pairs, put them on the graph. Well, when it comes to plotting these ordered pairs, just like we saw in the t table, we can just pick random points, any values we want. And since integers are the easiest to work with, I can look at this and say, OK, well, let's choose negative 1 for x. And I generally choose the values negative 1, 0, and 1 for graphing linear equations. They're nice numbers to work with, 1 and 0. So if this is negative 1, negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. When x is negative 1, y would be negative 2. So when x is negative 1, I move 1 to the left of the y-axis. And then I'd go down two spots. This is the value, negative 1, negative 2. So I'm going to graph that point there. Now, if I choose x to be 0, if I put 0 in here, 0 times 2 is 0. Well, 0 times anything is 0 y equals 0 when x is 0. Well, this is the origin of the graph. And it just happens to be 0, 0. That is def the definition of origin. And let's do one more point just in case. I'm going to choose 1. 2 times 1 is 2. When x is 1, y would be equal to 2. So I move 1 to the right for the x value. And then up to this value is 1, 2. Now we can see they all line up in a straight line, hence the term linear equation. Now, if we think about it, how many points do we actually need in order to graph a line? At minimum, we need two points. To, to connect two points, you would draw a straight line. So essentially, two points is all you really need. Now, if we move to this one here, y equals negative 2x, how is that different than y equals 2x? Well, if we plot these same points, I'm going to use negative 1. If I, or same x values, excuse me. Negative 1 times negative 2 is a positive 2. Well, when x is negative 1, y is a positive 2, because a negative times a negative. When x is 0, we still get 0, the origin. When x is 1, 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. So when x is 1, y is negative 2. 
So if we connect these points, we see the, the straight line that they begin to form. Well, it's a little bit different than this. One is increasing from left to right, and one is decreasing from left to right. And uh, we'll define that in the next section when we talk about slope, right? Positive and negative. That's the only difference between these two uh, equations. Yet we can see they represent different solutions. Now, if we look at this example, y equals negative 1 half, well, if I choose these standard values that I like to use, negative 1, 0, and 1, well, if I put negative 1 in here, I know a negative times a negative is positive, and 1 times 1 half is 1 half. So when x is negative 1, y is 1 half. Well, sometimes the points that we have to graph aren't going to be nice integers. Sometimes they'll be fractions. And sometimes we might even have to estimate uh, if they're a repeating fraction or a non-terminating decimal. If I pl plug in 0, 0 times anything is 0. So when x is 0, y is 0. And if I plug in 1, 1 times a negative 1 half. So when x is 1, y is negative 1 half. And we can see, again, they're starting to form that straight line. So I'm going to go ahead and connect these with a straight line. And I can see this graph here. Well, notice it was negative, and it's decreasing from left to right. Just like this one was negative, decreasing left to right. It's just not decreasing as much because it was only 1 half and not 2. All right, <clears throat> let's look at this example here. Well, let's pick the same values for x. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 minus 1, using order of operations, we get negative 3. So when x is negative 1, y is negative 3. So that would be our point there. If I plug in 0, well, 2 times 0 is 0. Anything times 0, right? 0 minus 1 is negative 1. y equals negative 1 when x was 0. So when x is 0, y is negative 1. And then we're going to use the point 1. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. So when x is 1, y is 1. And again, we can see these are all lining up in a nice straight line here. So I'm going to connect them. And we can see this has a positive slope, very similar to this one, which had 2x. This one had 2x as well. And they actually have a very similar increase from left to right. But how it's different is, well, it didn't pass through the origin like this one. It actually looks like it was shifted down. Well, that's something we'll define in the next section about how these equations affect the graph of the line. All right, a certain type of point that we're going to define right now is called the intercept. So let's go back to this graph over here, and we'll define these intercepts. Now, one of what an intercept is, as an example, a y-intercept, is when x is 0. So if I were asked to find the y-intercept, x is 0, y is going to be some value. And we denote it with the value of b. Well, we already found that in this example. When x was 0, we found y to be 9 halves, or vice versa. y is 9 halves when x is 0. That was this point right here. We defined this as the y-intercept. And this is just my abbreviation for intercept, y-intercept. This point here is a very particular point. When x is 0, y is some value. This is where it crosses the y-axis. And that's why it's called the y-intercept. Now, what about this point here? Now, I can see that it's in between uh, this value and this value. And if we say, count over, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's somewhere between 7 and 8. But exactly how much, I'm not sure. So we can find intercepts. This would be defined as the x-intercept. And the x-intercept is where it crosses or touches the x-axis. So how can I find that? Well, what is the y value here? The y value is 0. When the y value is 0, x equals 9. Well, that tells me something very important, that my line wasn't exactly straight. This would actually be the value when y is 0, x is 9. Because if this is 0, x equals 9. So maybe I should have drew my line a little bit better. So maybe we can see that using the algebra over a graph is going to be a little bit more exact. And we'll get to uh, actually using the algebra to find intercepts shortly. We did it as an example right here. 
But what we really need to understand is defining the intercepts, locating the intercepts. So if we look at these four different graphs here, hopefully we can look at this one and say, well, these aren't linear, but these ones look like straight lines. We have a vertical line, and we have a horizontal line. If we're asked to identify the intercepts, well, we just have to say, where do they cross the axes? We know this is the y-axis, and this is the x-axis. So if I want to find the y-intercept, I say, where does it cross the y-axis? Well, I see it crosses right here. So if I'm asked to determine what the y-intercept is, I'm going to write an ordered pair that identifies that. And it's very important to write it as an ordered pair. What is the x value? The x value is 0 because it's right on the y-axis. And the y value is negative 1. This is the y-intercept. So if I'm asked to find the y-intercept, I'm going to write an ordered pair where x will always be 0. That is how we define the y-intercept. The x value is 0. We're right on the x-axis. What if we're asked to find the x-intercept? Well, the x-intercept is where the y value is 0. Well, the y value is 0 at the x-axis. And we can see it crosses right here. Well, what is the x value? The x value is 1, 2. It's over 2. So the x-intercept is 2, 0. So notice, by definition, the y-intercept is when x is 0. It crosses the y-axis. The x-intercept is when y is 0. One way to remember that is if you're asked for an intercept, the other value is always 0. All right, let's look at this example. Again, it's not linear. We can see it's not a straight line. But we can still determine the intercept. So let's find the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is when x is 0. So I just have to determine what the y value is. If I look at this, well, maybe, maybe this value is about 2 and a half, right? 1, 2, it's between 2 and 3. Uh, and because we have to estimate on the graph, we're going to say it's 2 and a half, or we're going to say 5 halves. All right, what about the x-axis intercepts or the x-intercepts? Well, I see there's one here and one here, because there are two places in which it crosses. And that can sometimes happen in nonlinear equations. But our goal here is just to identify any intercepts. Well, we know that the y value is 0. And the x value here would be negative 2. It's two spots to the left. Here, we see that the x value is 3. And it crosses the axis, the x-axis, so the y value is 0. So hopefully, we can determine those. What about this one? Now, I mentioned that this is a special line. It's a vertical line. And it passes the, through the x-axis, so I can find the x-intercept. But what about the y-intercept? Well, since it's parallel to the y-axis, it never crosses it. This is an example of a graph where there is no y-intercept. Sometimes that can happen. So if we're asked to find the intercept, there is only an x-intercept. And we actually have to determine what that value is. Well, since it's an x-intercept, we know y is 0. What is the x value? Well, it's 1 and, let's say, a half, 1 and a half, which we'll call 3 halves. So we have the x-intercept of 3 halves when y is 0. And being that this is a horizontal line, that's, it's a special case that I had mentioned. If we notice, the x value never changes. Well, if the x value never changes, it is 3 halves. x equals 3 halves. That's that special equation that we talked about uh, in that previous example, x equals 3 halves. What about this value here? If we look at this line, it is a horizontal line. And if we look at its y-intercept, because it doesn't cross the x-axis, because it's parallel, it never crosses. So the only thing we're going to find here is a y-intercept. There is no x-intercept. So what is that value? Well, when x is 0, we can see it passes through right here, 1, 2, 3, and 1 half. 3 and 1 half, we could write it as a mixed number. Uh, but I like to write fraction, so 7 halves, because it's not always going to be an integer, like I said before. So we found the y-intercept to be 0, 7 halves for this line. Now, if we notice, just like in the previous example, 
a value never changes. In this case, the y value never changes. So y equals and, oh, a negative 7 halves. I almost made a sign error. If you notice, because I'm below the axis, these are the negative values in y. So 0, negative 7 halves. All right, and this is the equation for a horizontal line, where y equals a number. It never changes. So two special cases of linear equations. They're not going to have the slopes as we've seen in the previous example. And as we progress through this chapter, we'll see how to determine some of these uh, things and what's special about them, what defines them as being either a vertical line or a horizontal line or a line that's increasing or decreasing. And we'll define that more, so don't, uh, don't fret too much. All right, <clears throat> if we look at this example here, we have 2x plus y equals 4. We have a new linear equation, and we want to graph it. Now, we don't have a table of values, so we could choose different values. But one tool to use is what we just defined, intercepts. Using the intercepts, what I like to do is say, well, if x is 0, I'm going to find the y-intercept. The y-intercept is when the x value is 0. So 0 times anything is 0. So I can just cover it up, and I can see y equals 4 when that x value is 0. So if y equals 4, when x is 0, I found the intercept. So when x is 0, y is 4. And I'm going to label this point because intercepts are very important. So I label it with an ordered pair. And now I'm going to find the x-intercept. Well, that's when the y value is 0. Well, if the y value is 0, I can ask myself 2 times x equals 4. 2 times what equals 4? Well, algebraically, I could undo that multiplication with division, divide both sides by 4. And if I do that, I get x equals 2. And if you work that out, you'll see that as well. 2 times 2 equals 4. So when y is 0, we're on the x-axis, we get x equals 2. And I'm going to label that 2. 0, the ordered pair. This is my x-intercept. Now, we had said, at minimum, we need two points to draw any line. Well, I have two points, and now I can connect them. And hopefully, I drew a relatively straight line. Kind of difficult without a straight edge. All right, let's see an application to where we can use a linear equation. Here's our application. It says the revenue y in billions of dollars for Home Depot during the years 1998 to 2001 is given by the equation y equals 8x plus 30, where x is the number of years after 1998. Um, if we were to graph this and use values like 1,998, you can see how our graph could be kind of unmanageable with huge numbers. This tells me something very important. X is the number of years after 1998. So if I think about it, 1998 is how many years after 1998? Well, it's no years. They're the same. So I can say 1998 equals 0 in x, my reference point. I'm starting at 1998. All right. And then use the equation to estimate the revenue in 2000. So we have this basis of saying, well, 1998 represents the year 0, my reference point. So if I'm going to estimate what the value was in 2000, we can take this and we actually put it on a graph and see what ordered pairs we can interpolate from that. So let's look at this. We have y equals 8x plus 30. And we already determined that 1998 is 0. So I'm going to write down here 1998 represents 0 in the x, which is the y-axis. And if this is 0, 0 times 8 is 0, y equals 30. If this is 0, y equals 30. And we have to determine a scale here. Well, let's say that each tick mark represents 10. Uh, billion, because y is in billions, which we determined in the example here. So this would be my y-intercept. When x is 0, y is 30 billion. So I'm labeling that ordered pair. 
Now, if the next year, one year from 1998, this would represent 1999, well, that would be my first value in x. So I could plug that in and get 1 and 8 is 38. And if each of these tick, tick marks represents 10, it would be between the third and the fourth one. Between 30 and 40 would be 38, because x is 1. 30 plus 8 is 38. And we could continue to put these values in. Uh, in 2000 would be the second year. So I could put 2 in here. 2 times 8 is 16, plus 30 would be 46. So that's somewhere in between uh, these, our fourth and fifth line. 46 would be that value. So if we wanted to estimate that, maybe because we were asked the year 2000, we could estimate that and say, well, that's somewhere between 40 and 50 billion. That would be a good estimate. Maybe we say 45 billion. If we wanted to do it algebraically, we could actually use that equation. In the year 2000, which represents two years after, we got 46. 46 billion. But if we're estimating that, it's somewhere between, we'd say, 4 and a half. So let's go over here and just say, well, our estimate would be uh, 45 billion. And we use the graph to just kind of estimate it, to see in between those lines of our linear equation from 1998 forward to 2001. And we estimated, well, that's somewhere in between. So it would be 45 billion. If we plug it into the equation, we'd get the exact values. And in future uh, sections of this chapter, you're going to be asked to find those exact values. So let's just do it now. Two years after 1998 is the year 2000, what we were asked to find. 2 times 8 is 16, plus that 30 is 46 billion. Billion what? Dollars. Those units are very important, not just the number, but the unit as well. So hopefully you understand the concept of the years. We're saying 1998 is our origin or our reference point, and every year after that. We can use the graph to estimate. We can use the equation to find exact values. So this has been section 6.2. Thank you for watching.